Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem snakes and ladders and this is a pretty challenging problem, especially for a medium. It's got some good fundamentals to it, but there's also some uh, uniqueness to this problem that you can't really get in most problems. So we're given an n by n matrix. That means it's a square matrix, just like this one we see over here, it's six by six. Each cell is going to be labeled from one to n squared. n squared is gonna be the number of cells, of course. And the first one is gonna be at the bottom left. That's where the one is gonna be. Two is gonna be next, and then three, then four, then five, then six, right? We're gonna to go to the right uh, in the first row, but then we're gonna get the seven right above that. And then the seven, uh, the next values are gonna to be towards the left. Then it's gonna to go to the right then it's gonna to go to the left. So basically it's alternating directions. The order of the values is what I'm talking about, right? Seven, eight, nine, it's going to the left, then 13, 14, 15, it's going to the right. So we're gonna start at this one and we're allowed to roll a dice and it's a six-sided dice. So we're either gonna roll a value between one through six. Now we don't actually have to generate a random number, so don't worry about that. We're gonna try every possibility. If we roll a one, that means uh, from this starting position, uh, we're gonna move one spot. That means we're gonna move to the two spot wherever it happens to be on this grid. Uh, if we rolled a two, we would move two spots forward to the three. If we rolled a six, we would move six spots forward. So we'd move all the way to the seven. Okay, so if this matrix stuff wasn't confusing you enough, there's actually even more complexity. So we have uh, things called snakes. Uh, this is a snake and this is a ladder. And this problem is based off a board game that I've never really played, but I think the ladders are supposed to make you advance forward and the snakes are supposed to make you go backwards. Uh, but in the context of this problem, in the data structure, the board itself, the 2D matrix, the values of the board are going to be mainly negative ones. Right here, you can see the actual values of the board. It's mostly negative ones, except for positions that have a ladder on them. So this 15 corresponds to this position. What that means is that in the board, there's a 15. That means if we land on this spot, then this ladder is going to take us to position 15. So it's kind of like a shortcut. So if we actually did make this jump to two, uh, it, that took us one move to do, right? But in the same move, since we landed on a ladder, we're going to advance to uh, this 15 spot. That doesn't take two moves for us to do. Uh, the advancement is a uh, part of the same original move. Similarly, if we landed on this snake, uh, position 17, which corresponds to a value of 13. So if we landed here for whatever reason, then on the same move, we would end up uh, being uh, pushed back to position 13. Now the catch here is, uh, if this isn't confusing enough for you, that we cannot use two uh, advancements in the same move, uh, whether it's a snake or it's a ladder. So it, for example, if there was another ladder over here that took us to position you know, 28 or something, if we uh, landed here in one move, then we would advance to position 15 within the same move, but we can't use a snake or a ladder two moves in a row, regardless of what it is. Basically, we're only allowed to use a snake or a ladder once per move. So only after we move are we then allowed to use a single ladder. But then when we get to the second ladder within the same exact move, we're not allowed to use it right, within the same move. So uh, if we did land on this 15, uh, then let's say we got to our second move, right? Then are we allowed to use this ladder? No, we still can't. We have to roll the dice and the dice means we have to advance between one through six positions. Okay, so I would say probably the hardest thing about this problem is just trying to understand it. And let's actually read the rest of this question to make sure that we do. The main thing we're actually gonna be returning is the minimum number of moves required to reach the last square, right? So in this case, 36. Okay, so now that we understand the question, let's actually try to start with a solution. And as always, let's start with a brute force uh, approach. So initially, we're always gonna start at the square uh, one. And our goal is to get to the n square uh, position in the minimum number of moves. First thing, let's try every possibility, right? Well, we know we can move uh, between six positions, right? So from one, we can move to two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, but we know that two actually has a ladder on it. How are we gonna know that? Because we're gonna check the position 
here, right? In the board, we're going to uh, convert to into some coordinate, right? Some row, column, pair, uh, and we're gonna use these to index the board and get the value at this position. And what value is that going to be? Well, if it was negative one, then that would mean there's no advancement, right? Basically, three, four, five, six, seven, they all have negative ones in the board. You can kind of see it over here, even though it's not super clean, but they're gonna have negative ones. But this two position is gonna have a 15. That means there's an advancement, right, 15. So basically that means instead of when we land on position two, we're not really at two, we're at 15 because we just used the advancement. But now the question is, how are we going to convert a position like 2 or 9 or, you know, whatever, 28, to a row column pair? How are we going to do that? Well, let's just assume for now that we have a helper function to do that. Because this problem is complicated enough, we need to modularize this code. So let's not get bogged down on the details. We'll work on that implementation last. For now, let's assume we have one that's working. So in our decision tree, this two will really be a 15. And now let's continue this brute force. But as you can tell, this decision tree is gonna get really huge, right? Because each time, uh, each node is gonna have six children. So I am gonna take some you know, shortcuts, but I'm gonna explain the intuition behind it. So now let's do three, right? Assuming we were uh, doing the decisions for three, we would do, okay, four, five, six, seven, etc. But are you noticing anything? Four, five, six, hey, we already have those in our decision tree. Why would we wanna revisit them again? And remember, we're looking for the shortest path. Why would we care to reach four, five, and six after taking two steps, even though we reached four, five, and six by just taking one step. So there's no need to revisit any of the positions. So uh, how are we gonna prevent that? Let's have a hash set and let's call it visit and let's make sure that we never revisit the same position twice. Okay, so that's one thing that we learned and I'm not really gonna draw out the d d children for these because from this picture and the explanation below, you can tell that the uh, the shortest path is going to be from 1 to 2, which actually landed us at 15, and then from 15 to 17, which actually lands us at 13, and then from 13 to 14, which actually lands us at uh, 35. So you can kind of see the circuit that I'm drawing here. And then from 35, we'll take one jump and get to 36. So you can tell, okay, one move, two moves, three moves, and four moves. So that's the path. But from this uh, decision tree, how can we uh, actually create the algorithm for that? Well, the visit set that we talked about is very important because that will basically limit us uh, for the time complexity being the overall size of the board, which is going to be n squared. Uh, but to actually implement this algorithm, it might be possible to do this with a DFS. I'm actually not 100% sure, but I think it would work as long as you aren't visiting the same position twice. But the more natural way to do it is breadth first search. And that's usually the algorithm you want to do for shortest paths. And let me kind of show you the intuition of why, because as we're drawing this decision tree, uh, these are the positions we can reach after one move. As we continue it, suppose from 15, we can uh, land at 16, 17, uh, and actually 17 will land us at 13, as I mentioned. So we can't actually land at 17, but uh, we can also do 18, 19, 20, and lastly, 21. And so these are the positions we can reach in two moves, right? And the next layer of our graph is going to be all the positions we can reach in three moves, et cetera, et cetera, until we finally reach the last uh, one. And so we could possibly uh, create this graph with a DFS approach, but it doesn't really make a lot of sense. It would be better to uh, reach, uh, do this with BFS and then continue that until we finally get 36 to show up in one of these uh, layers. And it's possible that I think we might not even have a path to get to that. Uh, I don't know what that would even look like. Maybe there's like an infinite number of snakes that just keep taking you backwards. And if that is the case, uh, for the number of moves, we're going to return negative one, basically indicating that there's no solution. But if there is a way, in this case, there is from uh, 15 to 13 and then 13 
to 14, which will actually lead us to 35. And then from 35 to 36, uh, we basically are returning the number of moves. In other words, the height of this decision tree, which in our case is going to be four. And that's uh, the same that they had as well. And you can read through this explanation if it makes more sense to you. But I think that's enough for us to start writing the code. But one thing I will revisit is how can we take a value like nine and then convert it to its row column coordinates. First things first, let's get the length of this board because we know that's going to come in handy and we know that the board is never going to be empty. And let's just define a helper function for now, but I'm actually not going to actually write it out. So it's going to be int uh, to position. So basically it's, it's going to take some number, like some square, whatever the label happens to be. In our case, it was one through 36 and it's going to return uh, some uh, row column coordinates. Uh, but for now, uh, we're not going to implement this. Let's just assume that it works. Uh, and then we're actually going to get started on our breadth first search. So we're going to create a deck, a queue, which is usually used for uh, BFS. And we're actually going to have a pair of values. Uh, since we're looking for the shortest path, uh, you know, one value is going to be what square are we at? Like that's kind of the position in our case. Usually with graph algorithms, you have a coordinate, but like a row column pair. But in this case, uh, we're just going to use the square itself. Uh, and the second value is going to be how many moves did it take us to get to this square. So initially, we're just going to append to our queue one because we know that's the starting uh, position and the number of moves it took us to get there is, of course, going to be zero. And the second data structure we talked about was a set, a hash set in this case, uh, which is going to just take care of how many, uh, which positions have already been visited. And then we're going to get started on the standard algorithm, which is BFS. But there's going to be some adjustments we're going to have to make because, of course, we're going to need to convert the square into the actual coordinates uh, as well. But uh, as usual with the BFS, uh, we're always going to be popping from the left and then uh, adding to the right side. Uh, and popping it is going to give us a pair of values, the square uh, and the number of moves it took us to get here. And then from this square, we're going to do the portion where we roll a dice. The value of the dice could be one through six. So in Python, it's going to be a little bit weird. Of course, it's going to be starting at one, but the second value is non-inclusive. So we're going to put a seven. What this is really doing is I is going through one through six. And then using that I value, we can add it to the square that we had, which will give us the next square value. So pretty simple so far, square plus I. Uh, but now we're actually going to want the coordinates of the next square. And you're going to see why we're getting the coordinates in a moment. So let's pass the next square in. So that will give us the coordinates. But what's the point of having the coordinates? Well, if you remember, the coordinates are used to get what's the value in the board at that position. Because remember, if the value is negative one, then we don't really care about it. But if it's not negative one, that's important important because that means we found a shortcut or maybe a snake that's going to take us backwards. Either way, we want to know what, if it's not negative one, what is the value of that? Because that's going to be the next square. Within the same move, we made one jump and now we're about to make a second jump because, uh, you know, there's either a snake or a ladder. So we're going to reassign the next square. Uh, to whatever that value in the board happens to be. Maybe it took us forward, maybe it took us backwards. And next thing, before we even add this next square to the queue, uh, we're gonna check maybe it's the solution, right? Maybe uh, this next square is equal to uh, the length squared. And if that is the case, that means we found our solution. And we're going to return the number of moves it took us to get here. Remember, moves was the number of moves it took us to get to this square. And then we made one more move to get to the next square. So we're going to return moves plus one. Okay, but if we didn't find the solution, then we're going to add it to our queue. But we don't want to uh, ever revisit the same position twice. So let's make sure that this next square is not in our visit hash set. And if it's not, then we're going to add it to the visit hash set to make sure we never revisit it twice. Uh, and we're also going to append it to the queue. But we know that our queue actually has a pair of values, which is going to be the square value itself and also the number of moves it took us to get here, which is moves plus one. Okay, so assuming that this works, we will return the number of moves, but let's say it doesn't work, uh, then we once we exit the loop, they want us to return a default value of negative one. I don't even know if that there's an actual test case that covers this. There probably is though. Okay, so we've actually pretty much done the algorithm except for the most annoying part, which is gonna be converting a square 
to the actual coordinates. And to do that, I'm actually gonna go back to the drawing. So the way that this board is actually given to us, this is the zeroth row, this is the one row, this is the two row, this is the three row, four, and the actual columns themselves are actually straightforward, zero, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, but my problem with this is we're starting at the fifth row. That's a little bit unintuitive. It's basically gonna overcomplicate the calculation in my opinion. So wouldn't it be a little bit easier if the way the rows were labeled is zero, one, two, three, four, five, like we're starting at the zeroth row. That makes more sense to me. And we're trying to get to the last row. Now you can still do it the other way if you want to, it's not a big deal, but I'm just gonna do it this way. I think it's a little bit more simple. So the way we're gonna do it this way is just basically just taking this board that we're given and reversing it. What that's gonna do is it's gonna reverse each row in the board so that this is gonna be the zeroth row. Okay, once we have that, how are we gonna be able to take one of these values and convert it to this row and this column. Well, one another annoying thing about this is the values start at one. In programming, we usually start at zero and that makes the calculations work out a little bit better. We're gonna, whenever we uh, take a value like nine into our function and then convert it to the row column pair, we're actually gonna take this and subtract one from it just to make sure that we're actually starting at zero. So let's say we took a value like nine and then we subtract one from it. Now we have eight. Uh, how can we convert eight into the row column pair? To get the row is actually really easy. We just take this value and divide it by the length of the board, which in this case is six. So if we take eight and divide it by N, N in this case is six, we're gonna get one because we're gonna round down, right? And as you can see, that does work out in this case. Now, what if we had 12 as the input? Well, we're gonna take 12, minus one, which is 11, divided by six, that's also gonna be one, so it does work. Okay, but how are we gonna calculate the column? That's actually gonna be really hard, and the reason is because it's alternating. If it wasn't alternating, it would actually be really trivial, because for these, for the even rows, like one through six, we can just take the value four, and we're always gonna subtract one from it, so four minus one is gonna be three, uh, and then to calculate the column uh, index, is just gonna be that value, which is now three, modded by six, and in this case, it's gonna be three. And that makes sense, right? Because this is index zero, this is index one, this is index two, this is index three, right? So that makes a lot of sense. And uh, you know, if we jump to the next even row, it also makes a lot of sense because uh, this row is just gonna be four plus 12, and then that 12 is just gonna get canceled out by this mod operation. And, and then 16 minus one is gonna be 15, modded by six is gonna be uh, three again. So that makes sense, right? All of these are gonna be three, but the annoying part is, uh, you know, when we make two jumps, we're adding 12, that makes sense. But when we make one jump, we don't really know what we're adding because this is alternating. Remember, we're going this way and then we're going that way. So how do we correct that? Well, we're going to check if the row is an odd index. We're going to do some special calculation. We're still going to say, okay, uh, with our general calculation, uh, where we just take that a uh, value minus one uh, and then mod it by six, we're going to end up saying seven is actually over here, but it's not over there. We actually want to put it in the correct spot. And uh, when we try doing 12, we're going to find that uh, the, col the column for 12 is going to be over here. Uh, but it's not, we actually want it to be over here. So how are we gonna do that? Well, as you can tell, we're basically flipping uh, these positions, right? This is gonna be flipped with this, and then this is gonna be flipped uh, with this, and it's gonna go uh, both ways, right? So the way to kind of do that, uh, let's just draw it out, zero, one, two. So to actually do that, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the length, let's call that n, n is ju you know, just the dimension, minus one, because n is gonna be six, but the max is really a uh, five. So that's where the minus one comes from. And then minus whatever that column that we end up calculating. So in this case, if we got a five, if we calculated a five, uh, we'd say six minus one minus five, which is gonna put it to be zero, uh, meaning this is gonna be moved over there. If we calculated a zero, we'd say, okay, six minus one minus zero, that's gonna be five. So that's gonna take this zero and then put it uh, at this position. So that's really the intuition behind it. Maybe I spent a little bit too much time on this part, uh, but now let's just code it up. 
Okay, so as I mentioned, first we're gonna calculate the row and that's gonna be uh, square and uh, we're always gonna subtract one from the square uh, and then we're gonna divide it by whatever the length of the board was, which we calculated up here. Uh, and this is integer division in Python. That just means it's gonna round it down, which is exactly what we want to do. Okay, and then we're gonna calculate the column. We're gonna calculate it in the naive way. First, uh, make sure to subtract one from the square uh, and then just mod it by the length. That will work for us as long as the row is not odd. If the row is odd, and we can figure that out like this. So in this case, if the row is odd, we need to reassign this column and we're gonna do it exactly how I said. We're gonna set a column equal to uh, length minus one minus itself. Okay, so that's almost the whole code, but one thing I almost forgot is uh, we were actually gonna reverse the board because remember we want the uh, zeroth row to actually start at the bottom of the board. So just by reversing it, we can do that. And that's why this uh, function is pretty simple. If we didn't do it that way, it would just be a little bit more like, we'd have more calculations that look like this one. And I don't really like explaining how this works. Now let's run it to make sure that it works. And as you can see on the left, yes, it does. And it's pretty efficient. The overall time complexity of this is gonna be in the worst case n squared because we could end up visiting every position in the board. And the memory complexity is also going to be that because of how the breadth first search is working, we could have you know every value be in our queue. So I really hope that this was helpful. If it was, please like and subscribe. It really supports the channel a lot. Consider checking out my Patreon if you'd like to further support the channel and hopefully I'll see you pretty soon. Thanks for watching.